Welcome. My name is Crosby, Vin as in Vincent Crosby. Welcome to Boulder and welcome to Personalized Media 2011. Welcome to the Chautauqua Center. I'm glad the conference organizers decided to hold this meeting here in Chautauqua. It's a wonderfully symbolic location for this conference. Behind the projection screen on the wall of this hall is a photo showing the first Chautauqua meeting ever held here. That year was 1898. Everyone here was living in tents, canvas tents. Back then, it wasn't the high-tech boulder you see outside the windows today, but a pioneering group meeting to discuss what would become. Well, we're figuratively those pioneers today. Thanks for asking me to keynote the conference. Indeed, I'm going to start it with a very bold statement, a bold statement I'll then justify. Personalization, that is, individuation, is the major media trend of the 21st century. Some executives think these are dark times for media. Well, in case there's any historians in the audience, that's like saying the Enlightenment was a dark time for the feudal system. If your business today dates from the industrial era, in other words, if your business is mass media, media based upon the practices that arose from the technological limitations of the analog press or analog transmitter, Media in which all readers receive the same edition at once, or all listeners or all viewers see the same broadcast at once, then these are dark times indeed. The era of mass media's feudal primacy is over. Something new and enlightened has replaced it. Most media executives, schooled in mass media, don't really understand what has happened. I'll start explaining what's happening by telling you about my own industry, the daily newspaper industry. The newspaper industry is among the oldest and most hallowed of media industries. I'm here to tell you how lack of personalization, the lack of individuation, is destroying that industry in every one of the world's post-industrial countries, in every country where people's access and choice of media is no longer relatively scarce, but abundant. For example, here in the US, the daily newspaper industry earned revenues of nearly $49 billion in the year 2000. Ten years later, last year in other words, that same industry earned only $25.2 billion. The U.S. newspaper industry has lost almost 50% of its revenues during the past ten years. Some newspaper executives like to blame the 2007 recession for the loss. However, the facts are that less than half of that loss occurred during the recession. Most of that loss happened during the non-recession years, the years before and after the recession. An industry over 200 years old in this country has lost approximately half of its revenues during the past 10 years. Why? I'll tell you why. The reason is that newspapers and other media industries got caught in a conceptual trap. A conceptual trap into which most of their executives fell as they tried to understand the greatest change in media history. Most major languages have an adage about the conceptual trap into which most media executives have fallen. Simply put, they don't see the forest for the trees. Most media executives today mistakenly believe that the greatest change underway is that people are simply switching media consumption from analog to digital formats. These executives misperceive a trait or a characteristic as a change itself. Yes, they see the trees, but not the larger perspective. And their myopia has led them to formulate the wrong strategies for adapting to the gargantuan changes underway in media. And because most media executives misperceive the change underway to be that consumers are simply switching from analog to digital, the executives believe that what their companies must do to adapt is simply do in digital what they've always done in analog. The executives believe that all their companies need to do is use the same business models, the same production practices, the same packaging, the same products, and the same content in digital as they've always used in analog, albeit with the addition of some hyperlinks, audio and video and animation, and publicized via social media. That's the root of their not seeing the forest for the trees problem. It's about as apt a strategy as putting the Olsen twins in the deep woods.
Unfortunately, any strategy based upon a misperception will not only fail to yield successful results, but will fail to explain why successful results aren't yielded. So it's not surprising that these media executives are mystified why the digital versions of their traditional newspapers and magazine editions and traditional broadcast programs aren't earning anywhere near as much revenue online as those traditional products didn't print, even in the cases where the digital products have more monthly users. Moreover, these executives can't explain why the average user of the digital version uses it much less frequently and much less thoroughly than the average user of the analog version does. Such are the captains of most media companies today, misnavigating their companies through stormy times. Captains of business who, misperceiving the great change in the immediate environment to be that consumers are simply switching consumption from analog to digital, continue to hold true to the wrong course. Myopic navigators leading media industries into financial ruin, layoffs, and catastrophe. While they're fishing for answers, wondering why their business as usual doesn't work in digital or new media at all, we're here. We're here because we know the answers. We're attending the fifth annual International Personalized Media Conference because we understand what's really happening. We can see the forest for the trees. We understand the greatest change in the history of media. We know that it's not merely a change from analog to digital. We know that the greatest change is really that within only a generation, people's access and choices of news, entertainment, and information has changed from relative scarcity to surplus, even to surfeed or overload. Look at how things were 40, 30, 20, or even 10 years ago in post-industrial countries. News, entertainment, and information used to be relatively scarce. For example, billions of people worldwide who wanted access to daily changing information had perhaps just one or two, maybe three locally distributed printed newspapers, plus one, two, or maybe three television channels, and a dozen or two radio stations with an antenna range. No cable to satellite TV, maybe two or three dozen magazines on the newsstands, and certainly no internet. But all that has changed. Today, we certainly have a surplus of news, entertainment, and information. A torrent. Billions of people in the post-industrial countries have access to a surplus. In fact, the main problem nowadays is overload. We've got a vast buffet or cornucopia of information. The problem is picking the exact items we want. And that's the beauty of it, the exact items we want. Yes, it's true that people are switching media consumption from analog to digital formats, but that's not for format's sake. They're not switching to digital for the sake of digital. They're switching because digital happens to provide them with more choices and access to the news, entertainment, and information that specifically fits their individual mix of needs, interests, and tastes. Their own unique mix of needs interests and taste isn't the format they're after it's the greater access and the enormous choice of specific content they get from digital it's choice and access not format that matters to them the fact is that each of us is different each of us is an individual Sure, we might share a few common interests, the weather for instance, or if there's a major terrorist event or major disaster or something, but that's about it for common general interests. Each of us, each of you, have dozens, hundreds, maybe thousands of specific interests, and each of us is a unique mix of those interests. And each of us gravitates to whatever content satisfies our own unique mix of interests. It's natural. Let me put it this way to you. Imagine that during most of your life you had no choice of what you ate. It varied daily, but it was exactly the same meal that everyone else in town ate that day. 
What would you do if that situation changed and you instead had your choice of specific items from a gargantuan buffet? Oops, sorry, I said buffet, not buffet. Buffet, not buffet. Oh, how I hate PowerPoint. Would you continue to eat the communal, general interest meal each day? No, you'd probably use the gargantuan buffet and satisfy your own individual interests. Indeed, that's exactly why billions of people now use search engines every day. Billions of people are manually personalizing, manually customizing, manually individuating the news, entertainment, and information they see every day. They're hunting and gathering for the stories, videos, and other items of content that specifically match their own individual interests. Indeed, people have been personalizing, individuating, and customizing the news, entertainment, and information they receive for more than a decade now. It's taken a long time for traditional media people to understand that. For example, here's a quote from Peter Horrocks, the director of World Services for the British Broadcasting Corporation. And in fact, you could insert into what he's saying for journalists to mean also for entertainment executives or anybody involved with the information industry. Here's what Horrocks says. The consequences of this change in users' consumption has only dimly been understood by the majority of journalists. Most of the major news organizations had the assumption that their news products provided the complete set of news requirements for their readers. But in an internet world, you just see the total information set available on the web as their news universe. I might like the BBC for video news, the Telegraph or Daily Mail for sports results, and the New York Times for international news, Horak said. This is profoundly important. People no longer consume a single addition or package of information from any one vendor. They see their entire universe, all the websites out there, blogs, social networks, satellite channels, cable channels, as one package, one giant buffet. And they pick and choose the individual items from this gargantuan buffet before them. And nowadays, that makes a major radical difference in how information needs to be sold, the business models and the production practices. Because in this new world, the parts themselves in aggregate are worth more than the whole. People no longer consume generic packages. For example, look at the data in this table from Nielsen about US newspaper websites. It lists the number of unique monthly users these sites have, how many web pages they exposed during an average month, and also data about the frequency and depth of use by the users. This is the first assignment I give my graduate students in new media business. I ask them to tell me what's remarkable about this data. Students trained in traditional media, that is in mass media, immediately focus on the large number of users these sites have and the large number of web pages these sites expose. Mass media people have a fascination with superficial large numbers and they don't really look beyond those. However, the smarter students point to the other data, the behavioral data. For instance, do you see that the average user of the New York Times website visited it only 4.0 times per month during the period that Nelson did this study? 4.05 times per month in a 30 or 31 day month is only once a week, once a week for the average user on a daily newspaper website. That average user saw less than 27 pages all month long, which probably means less than 25 stories since many, if not most stories, are broken over many web pages to increase the number of ad exposures. And the average user of the New York Times site spent an aggregate total of less than 20 minutes all month on the site. That's less time than probably the average print reader would read reading the printed edition each day. So you can see from these tables that people behave towards content differently online than they did in traditional media. Another reason why just simply doing the same business practice, business models and production practice, and just transplanting all that into digital isn't going to be successful. People consume new media, indeed all media now in this new era, in a different way 
than they did in the past millennium. They're picking and choosing individual items. They might find a particular story that someone sent them a link about and go into the New York Times or any of these other newspapers just once a month or twice a month or four times a month here in the case of the average user. They're no longer consuming the entire package every day or on whatever frequency. They're picking and choosing it items as if it's a buffet. And look at the other newspapers. In those cases, the figures are all worse than the New York Times. Indeed, the Wall Street Journal, a site that people pay for, gets even less use, less frequent and less thorough use in this study. This data is proof that people behave differently, that they're personalizing, and they're picking and choosing items from this gargantuan buffet of abundant content that's now available to them. Never again will they consume it the way they did when information, news, and entertainment was scarce. If your media product is unpersonalized, uncustomized, and unindividuated, it will be used less than it was in the past. That's a given in an era where media is based on surplus, not scarcity, where people have abundant content, not relatively scarce content. It shouldn't be any wonder that people are using traditional packages of information when placed online far less frequently and far less thoroughly. That's because they're no longer consuming the package. They're instead picking and choosing an individual item or two from each. People use new media, which of course means all media nowadays, radically differently than they use traditional media. And that radical difference is personalization, customization, and individuation. It's a natural result of people having abundant choices and abundant supply of media. The old business models of putting out a product that you hope will satisfy everybody's individual tastes, a selection of stories, a selection of content, selection of programs, no longer makes sense. That's why newspapers as we know them in post-industrial countries are dying. That's why traditional radio broadcasts are dying out. That's why traditional television programming is dying out. Let's begin looking at this phenomenon, not as from what's declining, but what's ascending. Here's another example. At the National Association of Broadcasters Conference this April, Edison Research and Arbitron released a survey of American adults who use online radio. 53% of those people knew of Pandora Radio, which broadcasts personalized music. Rather than broadcasting the same music to everybody who's within listening range, Pandora provides you with an individuated broadcast that fits your unique mix of interests, your individual mix of interests. The future of radio is online. All the surveys from the last five years have shown that the number of people who listen to radio online, that is in personal computers or through mobile phones, internet streaming in other words, is steadily increasing. And the number of people, at least here in post-industrial countries, who listen to AM and FM radio through traditional means is steadily declining. Right now there's still more in the traditional, but all the figures show that that's about to change. So it's remarkable that 53% of American online listeners know of Pandora. But what's more important, look at this survey figure. A quarter of all online radio listeners in the United States had used Pandora. One sixth had used it that month, and one in ten online radio listeners in the United States had listened to Pandora that week. Show me a traditional AM or FM station in the United States in which one tenth of the population listens to it at least weekly. You can't. And indeed, you'd have to go back possibly to the very beginning of broadcasting, and even then, I don't think you would have gotten a tenth of the people in the country who had the possibility to listen through a radio listening to it. This is unprecedented. Pandora, which just went public on the uh, New York Stock Exchange, I believe. I believe it was the New York one. I may be wrong about that. Is listened to by one in ten Americans who listen to radio online. A remarkable figure. And why do people listen to that rather than the other 2,000-some radio stations in the United States that are online? Because Pandora offers them individuated music. Music that fits their own individual tastes. 
and isn't the same playlist that everybody else gets. The most spectacular success in online broadcasting is personalized, customized, and individuated. It's also one of the most successful apps on smartphones and tablets. What's particularly remarkable is look at the age groups here. Look at how many people, 25 to 35, have listened to Pandora in the last week, or 18 to 24. They like personalization, they like individuation, and they're going to want it now and into the future. Here's another example, Netflix. It's now the world's largest distributor of videos. Is that because Netflix has no stores? Well, actually, there's been plenty of other companies that have no stores. Is it success because Netflix allows you to run a video for as much time as you want? Well, the fact is that there's been other video companies with and without stores that have offered that same deal, so that's not the unique issue about Netflix. What has made Netflix successful against its competitors is choice and abundance. Netflix offers tens of thousands of movies, not the few hundred or thousand titles you'd find in a video store, but an abundance of titles that allows you to fit your individual needs, taste, and interests. This is also the reason that Amazon's been successful online. It's not their stores, they have none. It's not their interface, which is good, but it's not particularly great. It's the abundance of content. The fact that you can find things that mix and match and fit your individual interests. Again, it's a giant gargantuan buffet. That's what makes these companies successful. Abundance and the ability to personalize content from that abundance. And here's Facebook, probably the best example. In traditional mass media, in other words, in industrial era media, Every user sees exactly the same thing at the same time as every other user sees it. So is Facebook a mass medium? Well, with more than 560 million users, it certainly has mass scale. Yet every user of Facebook sees something different than every other user of Facebook sees at that moment. What each user sees depends upon that user's own individual mix of friends, interests, likes, and tastes. It's not mass media Facebook. It's individuated media. It's an example and a superb example of how individuated, personalized media succeeds. Show me another company in the world that has 560 million daily users. The BBC has traditionally been the world's largest media company with an audience of 350 million people in some 25 to 30 languages. Facebook now has eclipsed that. 560 million people worldwide in God knows how many countries and how many languages. And the success of it is it's based on individualization and personalization. It's individuated media, not mass media. Mass media in which everybody sees the same thing no longer is the prime way people consume news, entertainment, and information in this world. Individuated media is. And that's the point of my keynote today. We here today are right. People want personalized media. They want individuated media, not mass media. Mass media and the practices and business models associated were based on scarcity, not surplus or abundance. There was nothing wrong with it during its era, but that era ended at the end of the past century because people now have access to so much more. They want to be able to match what they receive in news, entertainment, and information to their individual tastes. They're no longer willing to consume the same meal every day that everybody else in town gets. We're seeing clear evidence of this nowadays in the 21st century. The rise of individuated media, what we're calling personalized media at this conference. Mass media will still exist. People still want to know the weather. They still want to know what the president says. They still might want to know about natural disasters and things of that sort but it's no longer going to be the prime way people consume information, news, and entertainment in this world. Individuated media will. Individuated media, personalized media, is the key trend of the 21st century. We know that the ramifications and opportunities are 
gargantuan. Billions of people today have virtually instant access to all the world's information. That's far greater than Gutenberg's invention of the movable printing type press or Marconi and Tesla's invention of broadcasting. This change will affect not only the media industries, but virtually every other realm of commerce, culture, politics, society, and civilization. But the fact that billions of people want personalized, customized content, individuated content, has gargantuan ramifications for the media industries. First and foremost, while it's great that billions of people are using search engines to hunt and gather, to find the individual mix of news, entertainment, and informational items that match their individuated interests. Hunting and gathering is a very primitive way to acquire things, be it food and shelter or news, entertainment, and information. So there's a huge business opportunity to save people that work, to find ways to deliver to them the individual mix of stories, news, and entertainment that fits that person's own needs, interests, and tastes. Facebook knows this, Google knows this, other pure play media companies know this, but unfortunately traditional media companies have failed to see the forest for the trees. What they need to do is change their business practices, their business models, their production practices into ways that allow them, working together, to deliver to each person those stories, items, and other data that match that person's individual desires for news, entertainment, and information. Permit me to repeat that. The media industries need to adopt production practices and technologies that deliver to each individual the personalized, customized, individuated news, entertainment, and other information, including advertising and other product and service information that that individual person actually wants. All sectors of all media industries need to work together, something unprecedented. They basically need to globalize. The reason why is people don't consume just newspapers or just magazines or just broadcasts or just pure play internet content. People consume the mix and people won't deal with different business models per media industry sector or different delivery systems per media industry sector. The walls between traditional media sectors must fall. Moreover, people no longer necessarily consume only content within their country. For example, if you're an English speaker, you might have gone to Canadian sites or British sites. If you speak Spanish, you might have gone to Latin American sites or Iberian sites or a mix. The fact is, media is now global. Online, there are no borders except culture and language. Indeed, not only do the walls between traditional media sectors have to fall, but the walls between national media industries have to fall. You have to come up with a common system that can distribute content to each individual that that content, that that individual, forgive me, wants. And you also have to find a way for that same system to be able to recompensate the content creator, no matter what country, no matter what India industry sector it is. If that seems like a tall order, look what's been done in the credit card market with MasterCard or Visa works worldwide, works in all countries, works with all sectors. Something like that needs to be done in the media industries for the media industries to survive in this global world, in this world of abundant content where people individuate content and where people pick items of content from the entire universe available to them online. All this will require huge changes in the practices and business models of all media, and likewise huge changes in the production and delivery technologies. Yet all the technologies necessary exist today. These technologies and their successors are necessary for media companies to survive during the 21st century. And here we are in Boulder. We're the pioneers of these discoveries. During the next two days, we'll examine personalized books, personalized magazines, personalized newspapers, personalized advertising, personalized greeting cards, personalized home printing, and other related subjects.
At this conference, we'll look at the technologies, the products, and the business models of personalization, of individualization. But I want to leave you with this thought. Remember that in this era when traditional media has an incredibly narrow focus and is incredibly short-sighted, that we need to learn a lesson from history. The technologies, the products, and the business models you see here are still embryonic. They're like the early automobiles, the early aircraft, and the early computers. Any new business model takes about 10 years to actually get established. And any new technology, as I said, with automobiles, steam engine, railroads, aircraft, computers, takes almost a generation to have it refined enough to actually work reliably every day. So we're still in the embryonic stages of this. Many of the companies, many of the technologies you see here may not be here 10 years from now, five years from now. Many of the companies may not be here. But that doesn't mean that the principles that these companies are pursuing, the ideas here, are not right, are not valid. If you looked at the early automobile, the early steam engine, the early aircraft, you would have thought there was no future for these things. The same here. So keep that in mind as you look at these technologies early in the period, early in the era of individuated media. The future of media is here with you now. We're the pioneers of it. Thank you and welcome to Personalized Media 2011.